Uh, today we have a very well-known guest speaker. It's Dr. Matthias Friedrich. Uh, Matthias is currently professor of medicine at uh, McGill University. And uh, there he's chief of cardiovascular imaging. And he's going to be talking to us today about recent advances in cardiovascular MRI. So thank you very much for joining us, Matthias. Yeah, thank you. Um, I hope you can see the screen well. Uh, do you also see the movie? And so that, and can you hear me well? Yes, excellent. Okay. So what I will try to do is um, give you, a, and it's always a personal view, uh, but uh, try to get go over some of the recent advan advances in cardiovascular MR, which I found interesting. Um, and I mostly uh, refer to more technical advances. Uh, so there are, of, there's of course always a lot going on in cardiac MR. And then and James, you have uh, some great initiatives uh, regarding the registry, for example. And uh, but I will more focus on the on the uh, technical ad advances. And um, uh, of course, any selection is a selection, and therefore cannot be complete. So. Find uh, uh, the, the topic which uh, interests you most. I apologize or uh, excusing uh, ask you for a, uh, uh, excusing that in advance. Uh, I also want to disclose that, as probably most of you know, that I'm involved in software development. So, uh, and also to just to have a little context, I wanted to repeat what I uh, do quite often that. In, all in all, I think the roadmap for advanced cardiovascular imaging has to go. Uh, to uh, methods, techniques, diagnostic approaches which are less invasive, use less radiation, less or at best no contrast agents and use biomarkers instead of surrogate markers. Uh, these techniques should be accurate and precise, have uh, prognostic value, be cost efficient <clears throat> and of course should have an impact on outcome. Now in cardiac MR, <clears throat> that's for cardiac MR that's uh, of course uh, as for any other technique that's uh, somewhat a challenge especially to demonstrate impact on outcome, which is notoriously difficult because no imaging itself will improve outcome. Only the decisions made by doctors based on decision on, on imaging <clears throat> can improve outcome. So it's, it's always, of course, difficult to, to prove that. But at the end of the day, every imaging technique will have to go through that uh, phase because just having nice images alone, uh, of course, would not, not cut it. I think one uh, important point to make, and as most of us are <clears throat> pro-CMR, I don't have to necessarily convince anybody here, but um, uh, nevertheless, I wanted to make one uh, point, uh, pointing to a study uh, which has recently been published uh, in the British Medical Journal, and uh, which I think is not discussed widely enough. And this was a population-wide study in uh, 680,000 uh, Australians uh, where uh, the association of uh, cancer with uh, CT was uh, made. And what they found uh, I think was pretty stunning that a single CT increases the relative risk for cancer by 20 percent, that two CTs do so for 30 percent and uh, more than three, uh, more than to, uh, the, with more than three CTs, the risk goes up by 40 percent. So it's all a relative risk, it's not absolute risk of course, but I think it's still <clears throat> alarming. Now, uh, of course, there's always, uh, there are always critiques uh, with, with the studies like that. Yeah, this is all the CT technology, and now the newer CTs, they can do uh, uh, exams with much less, less radiation, and while that's true that they can do that, the reality is that they often still don't do it, and often the, and I heard, I heard that from several radiologists uh, when I asked and they said, yeah, I, I know our, our mean uh, millisievert number is something I don't want, even want to talk about. And yes, we can do that, but often we basically fire up the power just to, to get better, better images. <clears throat> and another critique of that study was, yeah, of course, <clears throat> because you have, you have, people get CTs because they have an increased risk of cancer. Uh, and that's why you have a selection bias, but that's actually not true. The authors were very aware of that and uh, looked uh, with very long follow-ups to make sure that uh, at the entry, the, the risk observed was not a function of the, uh, of the risk, but actually cancer developing after they had the CTs. And uh, that was actually true, as you can see here, for basically almost all the cancers, 
So it was across the board um, that the risk uh, was higher uh, and, and in a dose-dependent fashion for uh, those who were people who had CTs. So that's why I think a key point is that um, if you can do, uh, if you can offer a diagnostic procedure uh, which offers similar uh, information as a CT and does not come with the radiation, you actually have the responsibility to use that technology instead of the potentially harmful CT. And I think that's a message uh, which is important uh, to, to bring across for, uh, especially for, for us who, uh, who uh, promote uh, CMR. I don't have to probably remind you of all the advantages of uh, CMR. Uh, I think it's a very safe technique. <clears throat> um, even the contrast agents, I think, uh, the, as I really am happy to uh, repeat publicly, I think contrast, uh, the whole uh, story about uh, induced fibrosis was a little bit of a hoax um, uh, because if you use gadolinium responsibly, which means a single or a maximum of double dose, uh, and if you do not do that in patients with uh, very severe uh, kidney failure, the risk is actually very, very small, definitely much smaller than with any other contrast agents uh, uh, we have. On the other hand, any contrast agents, of course, may have uh, an issue, and uh, uh, although we will not have the time to discuss that, I'm a little bit concerned about some reports where gadolinium may accumulate in myelin sheaths uh, of patients who received gadolinium, but we need further confirmation. Uh, there is also, um, related to that topic, there is also uh, recent um, evidence uh, actually that, uh, that um, there may be double-strand DNA breaks um, uh, as part of a, uh, or they found it especially one month after CMR scans. So this paper published by Lancelotti and others in the European Heart Journal and, uh, and backed up by an editorial from Philip Kaufman caused a lot of stir. On the other hand, uh, I think it's, it was very irresponsible uh, writing that paper, submitting it, but even more so publishing it without having a balanced view. Because uh, while it is definitely true that the CMR can cause DNA breaks, uh, so can uh, 5K run uh, cause an increased number of uh, DNA breaks, and each of uh, each of us has every day uh, has uh, 60,000 repairs of DNA break. So um, just uh, saying that MR uh, does that doesn't mean anything, and definitely it is nothing compared to the, the DNA breaks you get with uh, CT or with nuclear scan. But uh, we can maybe discuss that uh, another time if there's interest at the, at the end of uh, the uh, presentation. So we have a fairly high spatial resolution, albeit not as high as CT, consistent image quality, accurate quantitative data, very reproducible, small observer dependence, and excellent tissue contrast, access to molecular level, and especially a very comprehensive approach where we can do a lot of things in one single scan, such as bright blood imaging and uh, black blood imaging. The image quality, as we could demonstrate actually in the Stevenson Center, is uh, very good. So in, 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 the, the, in our population of uh, almost 6,500 um, uh, patients, uh, all comers, in, uh, in only 1% there was a poor, which means uh, non-diagnostic image quality, whereas all the others had a diagnostic image quality with 82% having good or very good. Uh, image quality. So that is definitely quite different from uh, other imaging techniques. Even CT, uh, if you go into real life, uh, doesn't provide that uh, consistency. Uh, and for echo, it's definitely much more uh, challenging. Among the indications, it's still the most important are cardiomyopathies, including myocarditis <clears throat> and ARVC and coronary artery disease. The, these uh, make up for about 70% of the indications which I think reflects the, the ability of uh, MR to assess tissue. So that, that's basically the, the, the a little bit of a context. Um, now, what is, what is recently, uh, what, what has come up fairly recently? Now, first of all, we have new training guidelines, uh, which are not much different from the previous ones, but the, the updated COCATS-4 uh, 
Task Force 8, uh, published by Chris Kramer and, and the group uh, around him, um, is definitely uh, interesting uh, to look at. <clears throat> the requirements, for, especially for Level 3, are quite substantial. Uh, but as I said, not much change uh, uh, with respect to the previously published. The other uh, societal recommendations, such as um, reporting, post-processing, and protocols, they go back to 2013 and will also probably have an update during the next two years. But that's the most recent one uh, here. <clears throat> now coming finally to the technical developments. Um, those I find interesting because they have uh, a significant uh, implication uh, or may have significant implications on clinical management. Uh, of course, uh, shortening scan time is always important and that's why the development around uh, compressed sensing and other parallel imaging uh, or, or parallel imaging techniques in, in conjunction with technical advances uh, where a complete uh, three-dimensional data set can be acquired in one breath hold uh, I think it's very is very interesting. Currently, there are only very few groups working on that, but I think that is coming, and we all should put some pressure on the manufacturers to to uh, to be very efficient with that because uh, that has always been a critique, and it's also a matter of cost um, because a scanner will cost money, whatever you do with it. So better use it efficiently. And uh, this study published uh, last year uh, showed that uh, such a 3D uh, single breath hold technique is, uh, can be as accurate as a regular technique. Another interesting area where um, the Stevens Center currently is very active uh, is uh, strain imaging. And um, there are several models. Uh, traditionally, it was done with uh, tagging and harp, but uh, the limitations were uh, some inconsistencies, uh, a long evaluation time, and a very significant uh, observer uh, bias. Um, and newer models, such as uh, feature tracking, or uh, now here this is an example of tissue tracking, uh, definitely come with, um, with much better results and much more consistent. Uh, results and uh, some recent um, data have shown uh, this. These are very uh, are pretty reliable. So here, an example of long-axis uh, or longitudinal and circumferential strain published this year in the European Heart Journal of Cardiovascular Imaging. And uh, if they compared it to, to standard techniques, um, they found an excellent agreement. So, long story short. Uh, strain imaging uh, using feature tracking is uh, is possible. So this was using the TomTech uh, uh, software. Uh, here's another uh, example um, uh, in, in PLOS One where they importantly could demonstrate that it didn't matter how experienced the reader was um, or not that much. Uh, so uh, even less experienced readers could get to consistent results, I think, which is a very, very important aspect. And uh, so I think strain imaging uh, can have certainly an important role, especially as a marker for a uh, more subtle uh, abnormality of function, but especially probably looking at diastolic function, where the markers we have in echo, the parameters, are far from being ideal. So that's why I think strain imaging with feature tracking or tissue tracking um, are definitely among the very interesting and very recent advances. Now another area which is currently probably the hippest in, in CMR, of course, is T1 mapping. And um, I actually started doing that uh, way back when with uh, Daniel Mesrovli, who was my student, uh, when we looked at uh, one Tesla uh, at T1. And, uh, and that time it was the first clinical study on T1. And what we saw is that uh, when we gave gadolinium, which was had not been demonstrated before, um, uh, only in late enhancement, but that you can actually use the T1 to uh, perfectly um, identify normal from uh, abnormal, or in this case, infarcted uh, tissue. But what we also saw, which was quite important, that uh, even before the infarct, there was already a significant difference with T1 times being longer in the infarction. Now we know that's probably related to the water content and the uh, 
T1 prolongation by that. But that was, uh, at least for me, that was the first uh, uh, glimpse of hope that we may at some point be able to get to tissue characterization without using contrast agents, which would of course make things uh, easier. And with time, now fast forward 10 years, uh, if we look at um, papers, um, and Vanessa was my student, I mean, you know Vanessa Ferrer in Calgary, so she, she started her CMR in, in Calgary, and now she's in Oxford and is now co-director of the CMR program there. Um, as it, because Stefan Neubauer moved now to a more administrative uh, position in cardiology. Um, so uh, she has uh, done some uh, very good work using T1 mapping and uh, uh, in this collaborative work uh, it was, uh, was obvious that T1 mapping can outperform uh, T2 uh, weighted imaging uh, and is uh, at least as good as uh, late gap immune enhancement. So that, I think that was very important to show and that also relates to um, visualizing extracellular volume fraction, which is basically just a, a side branch of post-contrast T1 mapping. Um, and I think that is uh, the, the T1, uh, the T1, let's say, uh, the, the current uh, host uh, of, of T1 or that people are very enthusiastic about makes sense because it gives you uh, a solid number instead of eyeballing, yeah, this is brighter, or even with standard deviations or uh, automatic anal analysis of signal intensities. Uh, that's always that always has been limited because signal intensities are prone to other uh, confounders. So um, and that's why I think T1 mapping uh, rightfully is um, is um, currently very looked at very enthusiastically. On the other hand, we also have to be clear about the limitations. We still have several sequences which are being used. Uh, there is a lot of uh, impact uh, by not only by the sequences but also by the system, the field strength, the uh, quality of motion correction or breath holding. And so there, uh, it, uh, I think there are many people out there who overestimate the current value of T1. And uh, I'm just putting together uh, a, a writing group for an updated uh, T1 consensus paper and I've been in touch with uh, James Moon and uh, with, with others and that will happen soon. So next year we will have an updated consensus paper with more concrete clinical uh, app, uh, recommendations. But uh, even even then, it will not be as homogeneous as it uh, should be. So T1 still has some ways to go, but in def definitely uh, in the hands of researchers and uh, in in, uh, in protocol um, uh, in carefully controlled protocols, it, it's already very important. Another area I found uh, find very interesting is um, is addressing plaques and. Uh, you know, uh, the, the so-called holy grails, uh, formerly it used to be coronary uh, angiography, which I always found uh, crazy to make this a holy grail for anything. Uh, but uh, people said, yeah, in a moment uh, MR can do coronary angiography, then everything will be fine. Uh, and uh, we all know that uh, the luminology is, is not, not extremely important. Uh, but it's more important to verify ischemia or perfusion deficits for that matter. Uh, then another, uh, of course, uh, target for CMR was and is and will be tissue characterization. But if there is something currently the holy grail, which means something which is important but we can't get, then it's plaque analysis. <clears throat> and uh, this is from a paper, a very nice review paper published just a few weeks ago. Um, showing the high, uh, the key points of uh, of um, uh, unstable plaques, and uh, a very important feature of unstable plaques is in this NC that stands for necrotic core, uh, are, is hemorrhage. So intraplaque hemorrhage, which eventually causes the dramatic effects. So in in the wall, and then of course the final uh, impact is then an uh, an intravascular thrombus. But plaques, unstable plaques typically have hemorrhagic uh, areas and that may be a target for MR and indeed um, this Japanese group 
published already a few years ago a paper <clears throat> showing that high signal intensity errors in native T1 weighted imaging images, so that's just strong T1 weighted thin slices, um, they saw areas uh, with a high signal intensity which correlated with the non-calcified or only partially calcified plaques on uh, CT. Um, and uh, what the, that was first the description, and I don't think many people took that very serious, but then this paper came out <clears throat> and showed that the actual risk of people who have that, as a, uh, compared to people who do not have uh, such high signal intensity errors, was, was about uh, 34 times higher so the risk for events. So there's a huge, a huge impact apparently on the prognosis if only half of that is true. And uh, <clears throat> while even that paper did not cause a lot of stir, uh, now it has been confirmed uh, by other uh, groups with other scanners. And this is just a very recent paper, again showing the same thing. And that's another group. That's not the first, uh, not the Noguchi group. But here they correlated it uh, with, uh, the, with uh, the presence or absence of stable and engine air. So people without these areas, they typically have stable uh, angina um, and only 18% have class 2 or 3 uh, according to the Brownwald uh, classifications, whereas those <coughs> with, these, uh, with these signs uh, um, more than 60% actually have uh, class 1 or class 2, and 35% have class 2 or 3 angina. And those with intraluminal high signal intensity areas, that's even worse. 50% of, of them have uh, unstable angina, so class 2 or 3. I think these data are pretty uh, interesting. Certainly, I think it makes a lot of sense now that many centers, that other centers get on that and try to verify or falsify that. Because if that was true, then we would have a very simple way of looking at the stability of coronary artery disease, something not even CT can do, because non-calcified plaques, as we know, may or may not be unstable. Calcified plaques are more likely to be stable, but with non-calcified, we do not really know. And that's where is there's a stagnation uh, of research with CT. So that is something where we have a strong clinical need, and, and it looks like um, CMR may have a solution for that. And the fact that hemorrhage shows up as a bright signal in, uh, in T1, and I would probably throw also on the table that hemorrhage, which would have the opposite effect on T2 stars. So if we combine image information, I think we could characterize tissue, uh, even if it's as small as a plaque around coronary arteries. There is a challenge with the spatial resolution, but I think it definitely makes sense to uh, go there, and I find this approach very, very interesting. Now, <clears throat> uh, back to T1 mapping. One example where, where uh, and I also, of course, want to show some of the research I've been recently based on, uh, on, on, on the work at, at the Stevenson uh, been doing so. Dominic Günsch, who was also in Calgary for a while, um, uh, was one of the postdocs here, and we did a lot of interesting work together. And one of them was looking at what happens to a T1 map uh, uh, after defibrillation, or in other words, does a defibrillation cause any uh, injury uh, which we could visualize? And uh, as you can indeed see uh, in this uh, pig uh, model, those were pigs which uh, had undergone another research scan. And then at the end of uh, the scan, we applied, uh, we uh, used a regular P1 map, and then repeated that after, uh, after defibrillation. And those were five defibrillations with 200 joules, so not just one single. But you can clearly see that the muscle is significantly altered with a lot of uh, uh, bright signal or, or red signal intensity here, which uh, reflects a longer T1 consistent with, uh, with edema. And we have assessed that histologically, and it indeed is edema. But the same was true for the heart. And so there was uh, uh, the T1 time is significantly increased in the heart. Uh, luckily, uh, none of that, um, uh, none of that uh, damage appeared uh, irreversible. Uh, so 
what we concluded from that, and the paper is in revision um, currently, is that uh, T1 mapping can visualize uh, uh, the reversible injury caused by defibrillation, <laughs> which I think is, uh, is uh, an example of how sensitive this technique is. And the native T1 mapping not only can, of course, look at, uh, at uh, edema, uh, but more recently, <clears throat> a group around Eike Nagel and Valentina Puntmann, they have actually used native T1 mapping to differentiate uh, acute myocarditis uh, from not only that, but also uh, convalescent myocarditis. Hey, Randy. And uh, what they, could you mute yourself? I don't know speaking there, but uh, someone is not muted. Um, and uh, this, this technique allowed indeed for uh, differentiating uh, controls from both acute and convalescent myocarditis. And if these results can be confirmed, uh, then I think uh, it is just a matter of making the techniques, uh, the T1 mapping techniques, just a little bit more consistent and we have a tool which allows us to stratify or st uh, risk stratify or stage uh, acute disease just based on native T1 mapping. And indeed, a very recent study uh, by Kali and co-workers has done that, used T1 mapping to uh, differentiate uh, normal from chronically infarctive myocardium. So we are talk not talking about acute MI, but chronic MI, where it was typically not seen as possible for T1 map. But as often, uh, one key point uh, I try to bring across with uh, teaching fellows, uh, and Ahmed, you may, you may testify on that, was windowing is very important. So with good windowing, you can get a lot of additional information from a picture. And there are some rules to windowing, so because you have to make sure uh, that you do not get to a point where you where you delete info or you make uh, information invisible. But other than that, uh, with good post-processing, post and that has nothing to do with producing something which is not there because you cannot do that, but just uh, highlighting the relative difference within the tissue, it, uh, it is actually possible. And in this case, they could show quite convincingly that they can demonstrate um, infarcts with uh, processed native T1 maps and uh, had a very good uh, agreement with uh, the late gadolinium enhancement. Um, and that was true for the size but also for the transmurality. And as I said, the agreement between standard late gadolinium enhancement and T1 mapping across the board uh, was uh, very good. Uh, although we have to see that uh, the uh, contrast to noise. Uh, of course, is smaller for the T1 maps, but it's still a contrast to noise, of a mean contrast of, uh, of about 8 uh, as compared to about 26 with, uh, with late gadolinium enhancement. With late gadolinium enhancement, however, it varies, and we also know the limitations of late gadolinium enhancement because if you do not pick the uh, right inversion time and do not use uh, um, phase sensitive uh, LGE techniques, you can uh, produce uh, inconsistent results too. Um, there are artifacts which that fat is a problem for late gadolinium enhancement. So I think uh, that this paper is a further confirmation that native T1 mapping is really one of the one of the huge advances advances uh, MR made recently. <clears throat> So shifting gears from T1 now to the higher gear T2 or uh, T2 star. So if you, if you look at T2 star techniques, you're basically looking at homogeneity of the field because T2 star is very sensitive to even small inhomogeneities. And inhomogeneities can be caused by anything with, uh, with a, a paramagnetic effect such as an iron particle. So if you use very small particles, uh, which are actually digested by monocytes, as in this case, uh, this paper was, uh, was uh, also recently published, um, then you can, uh, you can actually uh, visualize areas with an increased uptake of uh, iron oxides. So the, uh, and those are good markers for inflammation. 
And uh, I know way back when, almost 20 years ago, there was a paper where uh, they used uh, superparamagnetic uh, iron particles or uspios, that was what they also called, to, a whole, to do a whole body scan of inflammation, and that could be used, uh, of course, for uh, purposes like looking at, um, at unstable plaques in other areas, for example. Another paper I just wanted to briefly mention is uh, the looking at peri-infarct zone because I think that was also a major point. So looking at uh, the transition zone between infarcted and non-infarcted tissue and using two to three standard deviations as the gray zone, um, you get a parameter which has a, an incremental prognostic impact on all-cause death or uh, cardiovascular death. And I'm actually using that now in in uh, in, uh, in clinical cases, if uh, other markers for risk are not uh, already informative enough, so I think that's also an, an interesting new uh, development. Another new development, which is not really new, <clears throat> but is uh, getting a little bit more traction now, is interventional MR. <clears throat> and uh, the newer techniques now allow to track devices, even regular. Uh, uh, devices and so uh, things are moving uh, here. Uh, however, the limitation clearly is that um, getting research a research program started with intervention MR is extremely difficult because you need an interventionalist who has enough interest in cardiac MR that he gets out of the cath lab, cath lab, and you have to have a system which is set up for that, and you have to have ethics uh, for that, and. So it's it's definitely a huge undertaking, um, and uh, it is it may still take take some year years, but devices have become better, and uh, and I hope that there will be a few centers in the future who will uh, or people who will be interested in pursuing that. And the last uh, thing I wanted to uh, stress, of course, is. Uh, um, uh, a baby we had uh, already uh, in, in, in Berlin and then in Calgary and then in Montreal in Montreal here and that's oxygenation sensitive MR and I uh, we'll have to go back a little bit um, so when I was a cardiology resident that's how simple the world looked like for me so there's progressive uh, uh, atherosclerosis of the vessels with a mismatch of uh, blood flow and uh, oxygen demand, or oxygen supply and demand, which eventually leads to ischemia. But many, many clinical cases and also papers have shown that, um, that it's not that simple, that even in the absence of any coronary artery stenosis, other factors may, uh, do, may uh, impair blood flow and result in ischemia. And even with normal blood flow, uh, factors affecting the demand, <clears throat> such as hypertrophy or increased workload, may still lead to ischemia. And hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is just one example. And uh, also the other way around. So if uh, if you have coronary artery stenosis, even occlusion sometimes can uh, collaterals can make up for that loss of uh, blood flow. Uh, and metabolic adaptation, uh, for example, can still prevent a mismatch. Um, so. Um, that's why uh, it's not that easy, and eventually we, of course, want to be want to know about ischemia itself. And ischemia imaging is currently not done anywhere. We only use uh, surrogate markers such as perfusion, uh, tracer uptake, and and such, or dysfunction. Uh, but um, since the early 90s, we have a method uh, which is used in functional MR, which is T2-star sensitive. And as Linus Pauling has shown in 1936, uh, where I still don't know why he did that, uh, but he assessed the magnetic properties of hemoglobin and found that deoxygenated hemoglobin has paramagnetic properties or uh, destabilizes regional magnetic fields, which is, which is similar what, to what iron does. So it will reduce the signal intensity if present. So if you have a uh, tissue which tends to have less uh, or more deoxygenated hemoglobin, the signal intensity will be lower. And using this technique, uh, a long time ago, we have shown that you can actually see a difference between uh, in the myocardium if there is a severe coronary artery stenosis. But at that time, we saw that the scatter, as you can see here in the left lower panel, 
this kind of was just unacceptable to use it clinically as such. But again, fast forward uh, to our studies in Calgary, uh, techniques now using modified uh, steady state free precession techniques actually show that you can visualize changes of uh, uh, oxygenation in the myocardium. And we could prove that this is not a, not a, uh, a factor uh, or not directly correlated, linearly correlated with blood flow, but really with oxygenation. And the technique has been used by others, and, uh, and a lot of that has been confirmed and compared here with uh, fraction flow reserve. <clears throat> and uh, we have also uh, done this, Judy uh, has published that last year in, in Calgary, where we could show that uh, if there is uh, more than 5% signal intensity increase during adenosine, these people always have a normal fraction flow reserve, whereas if that signal intensity increase is smaller, uh, only very few have normal uh, FFR, and the bulk has a decreased uh, FFR. And uh, we also could show that once the fraction flow reserve is below 0.56, then you actually have a net decrease of the signal intensity. So apparently, According to these data, if your fraction flow reserve is critically low, that's at 0.56, then you get the famous coronary steel phenomenon, where actually blood is taken away from areas instead of what adenosine usually would do, uh, brought to the area, simply because the other areas, quote unquote, steal, uh, steal it. And um, that uh, a very recent paper uh, from Oxford has. Uh, has uh, confirmed that. So they also uh, correlated that with uh, metabolic studies with creatine phosphate. And the uh, creatine phosphate over ATP ratio is a very good marker for the energetic state of the myocardium. And uh, what they could show that in a, in a healthy uh, volunteer, there's virtually no change uh, of that balance between the creatine phosphate, which is sort of a storage for ATP or for the phosphate and can give a phosphate at any time to a depleted ATP. Uh, whereas in diabetic uh, uh, patients, uh, that uh, ratio was uh, decreased um, and uh, slightly decreased during exercise. And that was correlated with, with actually a change of the uh, both signals intensity change which was 19% in, in healthy people, or in, this, uh, in these examples here, and uh, only about 5% in, in diabetics. So we see the first papers coming in <clears throat> with an actual application of this technique, where it's not just about the method development, but actually about uh, application. And one uh, paper we published actually last week in, in circulation cardiovascular imaging also did that. Uh, and in this paper, we could show that uh, Actually, I'm sorry, that shouldn't read uh, hyperemia, that should be a hyperoxemia. So that demonstrated that in, in animals we could show that if you uh, give these pigs too much oxygen or if you give a high uh, oxygen tension uh, uh, and uh, stress them with adenosine, you can uh, initiate uh, the coronary steel and they will get into ischemia. And uh, while this sounds counterintuitive, it is actually confirming clinical observations that oxygen in acute coronary syndrome is not a good idea. So people with chest pain in the emergency uh, room, they should not get oxygen. Their prognosis will not be improved, but probably will be impaired. And uh, this is why this study, we could actually demonstrate that in an experimental model. Uh, that the lack of the vascular uh, response uh, caused by hyperoxemia, because hyperoxemia basically leads to a vasoconstriction which cannot be uh, dissolved uh, or cannot be uh, counteracted properly by adenosine or other uh, stressors. And as you are well aware, we went one step further. We just not just used oxygen sensitive imaging with adenosine, but also performed breathing maneuvers to induce vascular changes. And that was the paper we published uh, a while ago <clears throat> where we could demonstrate that in a dose-dependent fashion, <clears throat> the CO2 changes caused by either uh, um, long breath hold, which leads to a CO2 increase, uh, or hyperventilation, which leads to decrease, 
have a strong impact on the volt signal intensity and thus on microbial oxygenation. So in, in other words, the, lo the longer these, and those were mainly underwater athletes, the longer they could hold, or the longer they held their breath, uh, the stronger they had an overall signal intensity increase consistent with uh, an increase of oxygenation caused by uh, basically recruiting the coronary flow reserve. And the opposite, which was very important to show, was also true that uh, with increasing time of hyperventilation um, and uh, decreasing CO2 levels, you actually saw a signal intensity decrease, which also sort of is, is uh, just confirming what we know clinically that people who hyperventilate because of a state of anxiety, for example, that they can get chest pain and uh, that is actually uh, um, associated with a decreased coronary blood flow. So these were the, the papers and uh, but uh, now we are moving on, of course. So recently we could show that the response to breathing maneuvers is as follows. So this is the this is the blood uh, the the myocardial blood, so the intraventricular blood. So so there is in the long breath hold there is not much change here. Only very late there is a small decrease. Whereas the coronary blood flow or in other words, here the signal intensity in the myocardium increases significantly and after about 30 seconds reaches a plateau. Um, and then uh, these values, there are not enough data points, but we're pretty sure about this 30 to 50 seconds plateau, which is actually, this, uh, this uh, was stronger, this response, than the response which we could elicit by adenosine which is quite remarkable because adenosine is the, the agent which is used clinically to induce a vasodilation. So that means that by breathing maneuvers, we can, uh, we can actually uh, uh, have uh, trigger a, strong enough, a stronger response than by injecting a highly vasoactive uh, agent. <clears throat> and uh, the very recent work uh, is highlighted here. So in an, in an animal model, NMO model we, we induced uh, coronary artery stenosis and carefully uh, uh, made sure that uh, this was relevant. We measured FFR and um, so we, we, caught, we induced uh, highly significant yet not critical stenosis. And what we found was then again compared with adenosine, that uh, the that uh, the breathing maneuvers were uh, they were more sensitive in detecting the associated um, perfusion or ischemia, let's say, than adenosine. And uh, as you can see here, as compared to healthy people uh, uh, or sorry, healthy pigs, um, the the pigs with LED stenosis. Um, they, while they did not show a lot during adenosine, um, during hyperventilation there was a strong response which uh, could easily be uh, verified. So I think what we have here is the, uh, uh, the, the technique which uh, may allow us to, uh, to do advanced tissue characterization, a dynamic tissue characterization during fairly easy physiological maneuvers which do not require contrast agents, which do not require any stress. Uh, neither physical nor pharmacological stress, and I think that's pretty remarkable. But now let's take that to the next level. So now let's let's assume we can do negative T1 mapping. Of course, we can do function, and we can do T2 star weighted imaging with uh, looking at oxygenation. I think then it may be uh, the, the it's not very far to envision a very simplified protocol where you use basically just three sequences a cine sequence, a T1 and a T2 star, because each of them uh, respond fairly specifically to certain pathology. And if you just, as, if, as examples, the most frequent indications are cardiomyopathies and, and coronary artery disease. So uh, you have certain features which lead to certain changes of uh, the, the signal uh, in certain techniques. So since all these combinations are fairly specific, uh, you could have uh, uh, um, even a software program could easily identify uh, certain pathological features just from these three sequences. And uh, the, such a protocol would not be very long and uh, would not require any contrast agent and not, uh, let alone any, any stress agent. 
And uh, while this has not been done yet, uh, actually I, I really want to, to uh, test that. Uh, some of that has been done already and there was a paper just a few weeks ago uh, where they used CINI um, T1 and T2 uh, uh, or T2 and T1 and when you take these measurements so let's say in this male the, the, the interstolic diameter was uh, let's say upper borderline ejection low borderline uh, but the T2 was normal and the T1 is normal so this is presumably a health subject and now the next case here uh, we have a slightly enlarged left ventricle reduced ejection, slightly reduced ejection fraction uh, T1, however, is different uh, and T2 is different. So in this case, this would be consistent with dilated cardiomyopathy. So there is no regional uh, massive change of T1 as in, in, uh, in infarcts, for example. So this is, it would be a typical case for dilated cardiomyopathy. And if we look at the third case, uh, again, just using these three non-contrast enhanced uh, techniques, you again have a large ventricle, a borderline injection fraction, but a normal T2 and a normal T1, so this would be an example for an athlete. Uh, so what I want to say is that using a, a non-contrast protocol and just by, uh, e by evaluating the quantitative markers, uh, I think CMR is now on the brink of providing information which is very specific, can combine, uh, in combine information on dysfunction, and we haven't even talked about strain here in that context, um, uh, T1 and T2, there's information on the tissue composition and uh, that uh, I think will allow to radically change practice uh, and this is the task I think we have ahead and those were, from my point of view, the most uh, exciting advances. So with that, I will thank you for your uh, attention.